Welcome and greetings from Washington, DC. I'm Tanya Joshua, Deputy Policy Director and Communications Lead in the Office of Insular Affairs at the US Department of the Interior. On behalf of the entire Office of Insular Affairs team, thank you for joining us today for another episode of OIA Conversations, where we learn more about people, programs, and issues that are important and relevant to the US territories and the freely associated states. Also on the line today with me is, is Philip Izerian, a Duke University student who provides technical assistance for this series. Today we are hosting a panel discussion in the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands or the CNMI, which compromises Rota, Saipan, Tinian, and several more Northern islands in the Marianas archipelago, which are anchored to the South by the island of Guam. Today's discussion is about ongoing efforts to counter the invasive coconut rhinoceros beetle that was first discovered on the island of Rota in 2017. The beetle has also inflicted much damage in Guam, although today's discussion will be focused primarily in the CNMI. Efforts to counter the, the coconut rhinoceros beetle have been partially funded through the Office of Insular Affairs. The panel will include many distinguished guests and experts from the CNMI, from, from the CNMI government, Rota local government, USDA and also the University of Guam. And before we begin, we would like to recognize the mayor of Rota, the Honorable Ephraim Atalik, and extend our special appreciation for his participation today. I now turn the floor over to Mr. Harry Blanco, field representative for the Office of Insular Affairs. He himself is based in the CNMI to moder moderate today's panel. Mr. Blanco. Good morning, Janafada, everyone. Um, Thank you again, Tanya, for inter your introductory uh, of this uh, coconut rhino beetle. At this point in time, I'd like to introduce the, the presenters for the coconut rhino beetle. Uh, we got the Honorable Mayor Efren Atalik, the uh, mayor for the municipality of Rhoda. We got Dr. Aubrey Moore, who is the professor of entomology, natural and applied science at the University of Guam. We got uh, Mr. Tony Benaventi, secretary for the Cinema Department of uh, Lands and Natural Resources. We got Mr. Dave Calvo, resident director, Cinema Department of Lands and Natural Resources uh, located on Rhoda. We got Mr. Frank Audan, Invasive Species uh, Coordinator, Cinema Department of Lands and Natural Resources located on Saipan. Mr. Mark Manglonia, Coconut Rhino Beetle Supervisor, Cinema Department of Lands and Natural uh, Resources located on Rhoda. And then I also like to introduce the Coconut Rhino Beetle uh, staff members. Uh, again, Mr. Mark uh, Manglonia is the coconut rhino beetle supervisor. Uh, we got uh, Mr. Bruce Castro, the eradicate technician one. Uh, we got Mr. Samson Lizama, eradicate technician uh, one. And we also, um, the new hired uh, uh, staff members that were hired under this Office of Insular Affairs uh, most recently funded uh, grant is Mr. Iverson Isarian, eradicate technician one. Uh, Mr. Gallen Chrysostomo, Eradicate Technician 1, Mr. Rafael Kirigua, Eradicate Technician 1, and Mr. Donnell Rangamar, Eradicate Technician 1. Those are the uh, hardworking staff that's actually out in the field. At this point in time, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Secretary Tony Benaventi. Uh, I've got some questions to ask uh, Mr. Benaventi. So, Secretary, uh, here's the first question. What specifically is the Cinema Department of Lands and Natural Resources doing to eradicate the coconut rhino beetle? Can it be eradicated? Good morning from Saipan. First of all, Harry, I didn't hear you recognize my good friend in Guam, uh, Mr. D, Dallas. You did? Maybe I didn't hear you good, but anyway. Yes, uh, thank Mr. you. Dr. Yeah. But anyway, uh, you know, thank you all, Tanya in DC, and our good uh, field representative, Harry Blanco, here in Saipan, and to the people in Rhoda, uh, especially the mayor. Good morning, Mayor Dave, uh, resident director, and the, the CRB crews in, in Rhoda, and as well. And Dr. Moore, uh, hi, nice to meet you, sir. I think it's my first time to ever see you, and again, to our good new uh, staff uh, from the OIA. Yes, uh, Harry, I know you mentioned something that what, what DLNR is, is doing. First of all, DLNR is doing so much uh, to eradicate this, this, uh, this problem of uh, CRB here in, in Rhoda. 
and also doing um, uh, protection in terms of our intervention and protection for the island of Ro Saipan and Tinia. I just would like to say that, no, you know, thank you so much, no, Department of Interior, uh, OIA office for providing all these fundings. Without your, you know, your support on this funding, this will never be a successful no, operation. And believe me, for all the funding you've been doing since 2017, when we first detected the CRV in Rhoda, so much funding uh, that came on the first year, second year, and and continue on. And we're truly grateful for, the, for this new funding opportunity that gives us the, the equipments we need, the manpower, and all the resources that we can move forward to try our best to eradicate. Uh, so much of this is is getting to be a point where hardship is is now spreading and we want to try and you know reduce it more or control it as well uh, that's our goal and we will continue on thanks to our our invasive species coordinator frank aldan and his uh movement uh in this process but dlnr will play a major role in making sure that our operations to work with the mayor especially the mayor and the resident director on how to further uh, move to eradicate the process of this uh, rhino beetle is, is a mere step that uh, needs to have a joint relation between this main office here in Saipan and the mayor's office and Rhoda uh, DLNR as well. So yes, we'll do our best, you know, uh, the funding is very important uh, since you know, all this situation we're encountering with the COVID-19, uh, but our role is, is there. Uh, the, the success uh, we can say is, is looking forward, uh, looking progressively to the point where a lot of the boys, the, the team are doing their very best to keep that netting and to spread out to where the additional areas that might have been detected. Uh, they, they, will, they will eventually move forward. And uh, again, no, uh, that will be more in the sense that they'll take that knowledge to inform us if there is any more spreading and if they're still in that process of just being in that particular area. I know that it has moved from the original location from the Tukberry uh, Beach Park to the conservation area, Popo, uh, the old Popo Hotel, and now it is now in the east area of uh, Rhoda which is at uh, Ponya Point and with a lot of private commerce no, within those areas that the CRB has detected. So we are uh, working hand in hand with the mayor, uh, the LNR residents, uh, director and the CRB team, and as well of our, our invasive species coordinator to keep further our, our eradication process. And without that, uh, thank you also I, for all that funding you've been providing. Uh, thank you, Harry. Thank you, Secretary Benaventi. Uh, my apologies for not introducing um, Mr. Dallas Barringer. Uh, he's the officer in charge for the plant protection and quarantine at the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture. Mr. Uh, Barringer, thank you, and apologies for not introducing. Okay, the next question again is directed to uh, Secretary Benaventi. Um, what are your needs to make this protect, uh, project successful? Meaning eradicate the coconut rhino beetle and or eliminate the threat of uh, to Rhoda and the Sinomai. Well, thank you again, Harry. You know that's that's a question that's uh, in terms of how how we're gonna eradicate. Eradicate right now is is more in the sense of our movement, but uh, it's it's there in Rhoda. To be truthful about it, it's it's there, and we can say it's it's spreading a little, not to the major point of of extending, but. Maybe Typhoon uh, uh, Mankut was the one that who spread it out to the east area, you know, with the rotation of the wind and uh, during all that time, because that, that was a major typhoon that, that hit Rhoda. And how it, it went to that particular area is a good question. Be it that it came in from, from a vessel that went to the east dock, we, we really don't know. But uh, the process is, is there in our goal. Uh, with with uh, the again the good of Rhoda, the mayor and the staff. Uh, one one aspect that we we want to be really strict in making sure that we don't uh, spread this out to all the other islands 
is to do a tougher uh, protection between our borderline. And one, one is to protect all outgoing, uh, be it that we, we monitor any incoming or outgoing, that we can work with the mayor and the quarantine section or the customs to really inspect, uh, inform, you know, those passengers leaving road at, you know, to make sure that their stuff or cargo or whatever it is, is well inspected and make sure that, you know, they're cleared. Because if that's not done, then we have to, to do our role here in Saipan or as well in Tinian, and making sure all of this area, all of these incomings are open and checked because, you know, we want to prevent this from coming into our island. I know it's there in Rhoda. We're going to do our best to eradicate or control it right now. But at the same time, the movement of ongoing passengers be it a passenger that I can say that is disappointed, we don't have it here in Rodad, like in Saipan and Tinian. Somebody might say, I'll pocket one and bring it in. So our goal, honestly, is, is hopefully that doesn't happen. But you know, the, the intervention and prevention is, is a, a risk that I'm working right now with the Attorney General's office to see if we can establish a policy and do what kind of protection that we, we want to do within our, our commuter. I don't want to be uh, a, a problematic with our, our good people of Rodan, uh, but again, we want to make sure that, you know, it doesn't spread out because once it's reached here, then it's a closer, the, eventually that goes to the other islands, which goes up north. I know it's there in Guam for, for 10 years, and then eventually it stepped into Rhoda. The next closest island is Tinian, then Taipan, and then further up north. So, you know, we'll try our best uh, to work. And if that policy ever comes up uh, with the Attorney General's new opinion, then we will you know, enforce our quarantine staff to make sure that protection is provided within our, our borders, you know, of, of uh, Saipan and Tinian. So we, we want to prevent that and uh, we look forward to, to continue that. But again, uh, our major role is more or less you new. Know, uh, eradicating it and hopefully that the success will come through a reality uh, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Secretary Benaventi. Next uh, question is for uh, Mr. Frank Aldan, uh, the Invasive uh, Species Coordinator. Uh, first question, Mr. Aldan, is what size staff do you have to handle invasive species across the Sinai and what other invasive species do you have other than the coconut rhino beetle? Thank you, Harry, and uh, uh, I just welcome everyone to the uh, guest or room this morning. Anyway, uh, the invasive species uh, program in the CNMA has a staff, total staff of about uh, 10, 10 uh, employees, and they're all fully funded by the Department of Interior. We have uh, seven in Rhoda and then plus one volunteer from the mayor's office in, in Rhoda. We have one supervisor and six uh, in uh, what's this uh, CRB uh, eradication uh, uh, technician. And then we have two uh, uh, in Saipan, which is under the Makuna Province Eradication uh, uh, Project, which is a, a non-native invasive species that we're trying to removed from the island of Saipan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adan. Um, the next question I have for you is, uh, are there any coordination efforts between the Sinai government and other local and fe or federal organizations? Yes, uh, thank you, Harry. Uh, yes, we do work with the uh, United States Department of Agriculture, Aruguam, Mr. Dallas uh, Beringer, we do work with uh, the University of Guam. Uh, we also work with uh, and uh, collaborate with the Regional Invasive Species uh, Council, which uh, includes uh, you know, all the Micronesian islands, uh, the island of Guam and Hawaii. And, and because we don't have a scientific personnel on our staff in the CNMI, we always refer and uh, discuss our our CRB problems with you know our, our regional partners, so that we can get input from them on how to 
what's this apply science to to our ongoing uh, uh, projects thank you thank you mr don i really appreciate your response on that uh, the next uh, question is for the Honorable Mayor Efren Atalik, uh, Mayor of Rhoda. Mayor, thank you again for joining us today. Um, first question for you is how important is the Coconut Rhino Beetle Project for the people of Rhoda? Uh, thank you, Harry, and uh, to all of the uh, participants, uh, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity. This particular uh, threat is really serious economically and culturally. As you know, the uh, tree, um, the, the coconut tree, I call it a uh, tree of life because it deals directly to our culture and of course the economic uh, impact. So um, it, it is very important that we, we um, control. I, I don't know if, we, if I can say we can eradicate, but I can say we can control it. Um, eradication is, erasing it, which I feel, I don't think we have the ability to do so. But I must thank all of the, um, especially uh, OIA uh, staff. They have really given us the financial support. And of course, the uh, delivery of that support from the DNR, uh, from Saipan, and of course, uh, from uh, Darrington, from uh, Dallas Darrington, Barrington rather, from uh, Guam, uh, USDA, you really help uh, protect uh, and uh, I would say uh, control. And uh, you know, on behalf of the people of Rhoda, the leadership of Rhoda, I extend my sincere appreciation for all that you all provided to help the people of Rhoda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. I know that you kind of like touched a, a little bit of response on the first question, but let me go ahead and ask you the second question. How would this affect the livestock and other wild animals such as coconut crabs, fruit bats, and sandbird deer there on the beautiful island Rhoda? On the coconut crab, uh, as you know, uh, if we do not control the, uh, the growth or population of the coconut crab, we would probably have a diminished a population on the crab and that in itself will create a, a serious problem for the uh, coconut crab population on the island and of course the uh, the uh, the economic impact of, of such a uh, invasive uh, uh, species uh, so it's really a, a problem for us and I I, I hope that this uh, particular problem does not extend to our uh, friends and relatives to the island of Tanian and Saipan. So I, I ask the Interior Department to really uh, focus on the control of such invasive uh, species. And, uh, and again, thank you for all of you. Uh, I would especially thank the, uh, the uh, men with the uh, boots on the ground because as you, as we all know, that logistically it is really the 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 men on the on the ground that are really really um, supporting and are helping uh, for 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 the control of the invasives. Um, you know, uh, we all of us here are really uh, supporting, uh, but the men on the ground are really really to be thank thankful for. Thank you, Mayor Sajus Masha again. Uh, next uh, question will be directed to Mr. Dave Cabo, the resident director for the Cinema Department of Lands and Natural Resources in Rhoda. And I know Dave has been working very hard in supporting this project. Uh, Mr. Director, I mean, Director, uh, when was the first time you noticed that the coconut rhino beetle existed on the island of Rhoda? Yeah, good, good morning, everyone. And uh, half a day from the beautiful island of Rhoda. Uh, yes, uh, we, uh, uh, October 2017, that's when I received, I was off island on a business trip when I received an urgent uh, text uh, from uh, Mr. James, acting uh, James Manglonia, uh, that uh, they uh, encountered a breeding ground, uh, nesting ground of the uh, rhino beetle uh, 
which first was detected in a uh, Berry beach, uh, east, southeast of, uh, I mean, southwest, or west side of Rhode. That's when they uh, went down and start, we start the department start, our, all of our staff uh, went down and we start clearing the area. And then from then we continue to find more breeding ground and uh, more damage of the uh, coconut trees in that, uh, uh, in that beach uh, site. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kalvu. Uh, the next question I have for you is, uh, how did the people Rota respond to this situation? Uh, the people of Rota, we, uh, as I, to my personal opinion, we caught, uh, we got caught off guard uh, and, and surprised with this uh, impact. But uh, the people of Rota are willing, and uh, and as a matter of fact, while we were clearing and 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 clearing a, a Tewksbury, some of our local residents uh, were surprised, and at the same time, saw a few of them volunteer in helping us. Uh, clear the area and support us. But uh, let me touch a little with uh, uh, I with USDA when they heard USDA team from Guam, Dallas, uh, Ben Kichuchu and uh, Troy Brown uh, visited the island and, and uh, put their uh, boots in the ground, assist us too in uh, finding more uh, breeding ground and, and help us uh, detect uh, which coconut tree has been uh, uh, damaged by this uh, invasive species, uh, rhinoceros beetle. Uh, without them, and at the same time, with the funding from uh, Department of uh, uh, OIA, uh, we managed to send a few, uh, five individuals from our department to be trained at University of Guam, with the assistance of uh, Aubrey Moore and uh, uh, Roland Kirwat in in detecting and 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 knowing more about the uh, the cycle of this uh, invasive species. But for the, the question is, uh, the people of Rota was surprised and they were all willing to participate and assist us uh, in, in, in eradicating this uh, uh, danger, I mean, an invasive species, uh, a buck. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Director Calvo. Uh, the next uh, question will be directed to Mr. Mark Manglonia, the coconut rhino beetle supervisor and I know Mark has been uh, working very hard since the beginning of this project. Uh, Mr. Manglonia, uh, here's the first qu question. Can you talk about when this species got to Rhoda as well as other infected areas? Uh, good morning everyone. Well we first discovered this one was in October 24 uh, 2017, I was a I was working at the mayor's office at that time, and then the mayor asked us uh, who wants asked the guys, the field guys uh, asked us uh, who wants to volunteer to help out Dillonar. So I volunteered. Two of my uh, colleagues uh, volunteered me and she Glenn Masga and uh, Johnny King. How many staff do you have assisting? you and what are their responsibilities? Okay, I have seven employ uh, workers right now with me. They're out in the field right now doing what uh, we've been doing so far. And we're going beyond the infested area in Gagani, in the east side of uh, the island. Okay, thank you, Mr. Manglonia. The third question I have for you is, how do you prevent this species from invest, uh, infesting other parts of the island? Uh, to prevent them from going beyond the infested area, we went beyond the infested area for doing more trapping outside the infested area. So we can catch them before they even spread out to the uh, breeding grounds. Thank you, that's a good response. Uh, the next question I have for you is what prevention efforts have you done to contain the coconut rhino beetle? Oh, even, uh, well, even the guys, they, I asked them if they want to do a come time, like, you know, on the weekends. Oh, well, I do it my own, my own time. I just go out and uh, just, you could, because the thing, the only thing that I don't like the beetle here, because uh, what I saw in Guam, the first time I saw the rhino beetle in Guam, I was like, you know what? I don't like this species here in the island of Rhoda. 
So I'm doing on my spare time, just go out and scout it and whatever. Because I discovered the one in uh, Gavani. When I went out to do a survey, I found out that Gavani has an infested area there. So that's how I discovered it in September 13, 2020. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mangloni. Again, the final question here is, how many coconut rhino beetle thus far have you caught or collected since Collect the beginning? Since uh, 2017 is 3,000. Thank you, that's a lot. Uh, <laughs> all right, the next, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, because uh, only in 2020, got, we caught a lot. That's all from Gagani. And uh, we caught there like 2,776 uh, uh, just from Gagani in 2020. Okay. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> okay, the, the next question is directed to uh, Mr. Dallas Berenger, the officer in charge for the plant protection and quarantine at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Dallas, the first question I have for you is, what is USDA doing to assist with the eradication of this species, equipment-wise, staffing, et cetera? Oh, thank you, Harry. Uh, before I get started, I just wanted to thank uh, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Secretary for their kind words and note that we've had a close collaboration for many years. Uh, USDA plant protection quarantine deals with uh, invertebrate uh, quarantine issues of invasive species and pests not known to occur. So uh, we got involved with this very immediately after the discovery in October. And uh, for us to be able to participate in an eradication program, one of the first things we needed to do was obtain an authoritative ID. So we sent that through our, our uh, network for an APHIS identification, which confirmed it was in fact CRB and it was the same biotype as Guam. And that opened up the ability to provide some immediate funding. Uh, so that came actually in fiscal year 2018 funding and uh, from a letter of approval from our deputy administrator with some additional funding support from our state plan health director office in Hawaii. Uh, we also, besides the, the funding, which was used to purchase some heavier equipment, like a lifter to get up to the coconut crowns to do the trimming, and sprayers to apply uh, treatments, and hand tools, chainsaws, uh, rakes, uh, all that stuff that goes along with clearing out the, the breeding sites and things. Uh, and also the trapping supplies and materials uh, to survey and trap for eradication as well. Uh, in addition to that, we were able to obtain some surplus uh, solar lights from the military. And uh, we had 10 sets of solar lights that are also helpful in attracting to the trapping areas and eradication zone and, and keeping the beetles from moving off-site into new areas, hopefully. Uh, so we, we also provided some on-ground uh, experience uh, with advice and training to the, the people getting started, Mark and his crew, uh, a great crew. And we created a database for them to maintain uh, all the records of the breeding sites, the trap catches, which allowed uh, doing reports, analysis, and mapping locations that could be displayed uh, on things such as Google Maps. Uh, in addition to that, we've been active in developing procedures uh, using drone technology, unmanned aircraft, and we've been flying repeatable autonomous drone flights on uh, the difficult areas for people to walk. Uh, basically, uh, we set up a procedure where we can fly the same trees, take photographs, and be able to identify whether or not there's any spread on Wedding Cake Mountain. 
then just beyond the immediate rota, uh, USDA was able to provide some funding uh, to the farm bill to continue or perform surveys on Saipan and Tinian uh, and help uh, prepare for or have early detection. And that's, that's pretty much uh, a quick summary of what we've been involved with and uh, continue to support CNMI in their efforts for invasive species. Thank you, Mr. Berenger, and I appreciate all your help there with uh, U.S. Department of uh, Agriculture and looking forward to seeing you uh, next time I go to Rhoda. Uh, the next uh, question is uh, directed to Dr. Aubrey Moore, Professor of Entomology, Natural and Applied Science at the University of Guam. I know Dr. Moore has been uh, working very hard in doing the study of the coconut rhino beetle and uh, wanted to hear uh, his presentation today. Dr. Moore, thank you again for joining us this morning. First question to you is, can you talk about the life cycle of the invasive species, its target food? How long do they live? How much grub can they produce? And of course, everything that we can hear about this coconut rhino beetle, the size and whatnot. Thank you. Thanks, Harry. I have a lot of fond memories of CNMI. Uh, I actually worked up there in the 90s for eight years. I was recruited by DLNR uh, to go and do a melon fly eradication program. Uh, and then I, I moved over to the college. I worked at the Northern Marianas College for two years. Uh, it's been a long time since I've been to Rota, unfortunately. Uh, I've been on, on, uh, back here on Guam for almost 20 years. And I've only been up there about three times. Hope to get back up there soon. Now I've got a good excuse. This is the life cycle of the coconut rhinoceros beetle. And uh, this, this will be old news for a lot of you people, but it's important to, to um, repeat some of the aspects here. Okay, so the rhino beetle uh, has four life stages. Like most advanced insects, eggs, pupae, eggs, larvae, pupae, and adults. The, the larval stage is uh, divided into three substages. Small, medium, and large, or if you want to get real fancy, first instar, second instar, and third instar. The whole life cycle takes about nine months, and the adults can live a further four or five months. So there is a little bit of generation overlap. The really important thing to understand about coconut rhinoceros beetle is that it is only the adults that do the damage. The grubs just feed on dead stuff. They won't touch anything alive. You will not find grubs in, in living trees or even dying trees. They gotta be totally dead and starting to rot before you find the grubs in the trees. Okay, so the adults do the damage when they bore into the crown of the tree. They're, they don't feed on the leaves. They actually bore through the developing leaves inside the crown to feed on the juice. They're liquid feeders. So they'll stay inside there for three or four days, sucking up the juice, and then they'll come out through the same hole and fly away and go and find breeding sites, uh, mate, and if they're females, they'll start laying eggs. A few weeks later, they'll get hungry and they'll do the same thing. So they feed about four or five times during their adult life cycle. So if you see a tree that's got V-shaped cuts, you're looking at old damage. That damage was done when those leaves, when those fronds were still within the stem of the tree. And it takes two or three months before they come out and then you see the very distinctive V-shaped cut. Uh, so chances are, if you see a tree with even lots and lots of V-shaped cuts, there are no beetles in there. A lot of people make the mistake that this is an infested tree, we got to cut it down. That is probably the worst thing you can do because when you kill the tree, you're making food for the grubs. Not just the stem that you cut down, but also the stuff that's left underground, all the roots and all that stuff. Okay. Uh, each female lays about 60 eggs during her adult lifetime. And that's not a lot of eggs for, for insects, but uh, if you do the math using that. You'll see that at first generation, you get 60 eggs, right? If they all survive and become adults, then that's 1,800 beetles the next generation. 54,000 generation three. By generation eight, you got one quadrillion, 312, two, uh, it's a big, big number, 10, 10 digits. 
<laughs> it's a heck of a lot of beetles. So if all of these beetles survive, you got a huge problem. When the beetles bore into the tree, they rarely kill it. It's only when they go through the growing tip or the meristem. That's a very rare occurrence, unless you have lots of beetles hitting the tree at the same time. It's kind of like um, Russian roulette. That's the way I look at it. So in, at low population levels, such as what you guys have on Rota, um, you're not gonna see many trees actually killed by rhino beetle. On Guam here, we have a huge problem because we had a typhoon that made a lot of food, made a lot of breeding sites for the grubs. The grubs grew up and all of a sudden we got thousands and thousands of beetles hitting the trees. At that time, we started to get mature tree mortality. When those trees die, they become food for more grubs. More grubs become more adults and hit even more trees. So right now on Guam, it's a really bad feedback cycle. We've got so many beetles, they're killing the trees and making more food for more beetles. Where's it gonna end? Well, when we lose our trees or get it under control. So we're, we're trying to get it under control. Only adults do the damage. If all of the eggs survive to adulthood, you got a real problem. So you gotta hit the breeding sites. You gotta find all of the breeding sites and destroy them. And Rota seems to be doing a really good job at, at doing that at present. Uh, you got to hold the line. And we'll talk about control a little later on. So back to you, Harry. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Uh, the next question I have for you is, do you think it's possible to completely eradicate the coconut rhino beetle on Rota? That's the $64 million question. Unfortunately, um, I won't say it's impossible, but it's highly improbable that we'll be able to get to eradicate the rhino beetle from Rota. And I'll tell you why I think that. Um, historically, rhino beetle has only been eradicated once. It's been attempted many times. Uh, when it was eradicated, it was on a very small island, an outer island of Tonga called Keppel Island. Um, and it was eradicated in the 1930s just using sanitation. This island is very small one-fifth the size of Rota. And the way they got rid of it was um, that the chief gave the project director the per permission to use as much manpower as he required. And they scoured the island, destroyed all of the breeding sites and potential breeding sites, and it was eradicated. It took seven years. It wasn't easy. So historically, there isn't much support um, for eradication on Rota. Uh, I, I kind of doubt it, unless uh, there are some technical breakthroughs. With some insects, there, there are ways of eradicating fruit flies. We, we know how to eradicate fruit flies. In fact, Rota is quite famous because uh, USDA back in the 60s did a lot of experiments on Rota and they eradicated two species of fruit flies, the melon fly and oriental fruit fly. Oriental fruit fly has never come back in. Unfortunately, melon fly came back in from uh, Guam. Okay, the other thing you have to do for eradication is you gotta make sure it's not coming back in, right? Uh, this is very hard with rhino beetle, especially with Guam being just to the south of the CNMI. We've got a huge population here. The risk of accidental transport up to the CNMI is, is very high. Uh, as you know, Honolulu got the rhino beetle. It's the same biotype as Guam, so they're pointing fingers at us. It probably did come from Guam. But if we cannot get the population under control here on Guam, it's going to spread to other islands in Micronesia. Oh, talking about uh, rhino beetle in Micronesia. Um, rhino beetle's been in Micronesia since before the Second World War. It was a uh, resident on Palau. It's still there. Um, and then in the CNMI, we didn't get it on Guam first. It was actually discovered on Rota in 2006. A single individual was trapped at, in Tanapag at the cement factory. Uh, Dr. Jack trapped it and, and did surveys for a whole year. He didn't see any other beetles. So Saipan was extremely lucky in that case. In 2007, uh, beetles were actually found on Saipan. It was uh, plant industry. Uh, the customs officers found it in a shipment of 
soil, packaged soil that came up from Guam. Uh, they were very astute in, in uh, dealing with it. They actually found beetles in the saran wrap around the packages of soil and grubs inside the soil. Do not transport soil between islands or within your island. That's a really, really high risk. Here on Guam, you can go to the local hardware store and pick up a bag of soil and it will be pre-populated with rhino beetle grubs. I'm pretty sure that's one reason it spread throughout Guam pretty quickly. Soil is a real high risk, but um, otherwise it's really hard to inspect for rhino beetle. The adults like to hide in dark places during the day and they'll crawl into anything that's, that's vacant, an empty container, maybe wheel wells of aircraft, holds of ships, that kind of thing. So they're not necessarily uh, connected to any commodity. They're really hard to, to look for, even though they're big, they're hard to intercept. Hey, Dr. Moore, thank you again. Okay, the final question I have for you is, can you talk a little bit about your current study of the coconut rhino beetle on the islands? So uh, right now I'm focused on finding a biological control for rhino beetle. Previously, we had this insect virus that was, did a terrific job on rhino beetle problems. If you got rhino beetle on your island, you introduce some of this virus, it gets into the population and it knocks down the population very quickly. Here's a graph showing what happened in, uh, uh, where is this, uh, Fiji. The same thing has happened on many islands. Um, you introduce the virus into the population, it makes the, the beetles weak, they don't lay as many eggs, and the, the uh, damage goes away. The beetle is still there, but it's under control by this virus. And this virus stays in the population for many, many years, up to 50 years. So you introduce it once. It's not like a pesticide, like an insecticide. You introduce it once and it, it maintains itself in the population. That's what we're working towards. Unfortunately, we've discovered that the beetle we have on Guam is resistant to all of the isolates of virus that are available. By the way, this virus only attacks coconut rhinoceros beetle, no other species, very, very safe. So uh, we discovered this biotype here on Guam, it's called CRBG, G for Guam. Uh, it didn't evolve here, it came in from somewhere else, we don't know where. We're not the only country or island group that's suffering from this problem. It's south of the equator. It's uh, killing the oil palm industry in Papua New Guinea. Rhino beetle also attacks oil palm. Uh, it's killing the coconut industry in uh, Solomon Islands and it, it's spreading. Uh, and it will continue to spread until we get, we know how to control it. And uh, most of the entomologists in the region think that uh, finding the right virus that matches our biotype of beetle is the way to go. So my major focus right now is on, on finding that uh, isolate and uh, getting it out there. Um, so I'm working with uh, scientists throughout uh, the Pacific on that. Here on Guam, we have a, uh, an insect pathologist by the name of Dr. James Grisella. An insect pathologist is somebody who spends all his time trying to figure out how to kill insects using uh, fungus or virus or bacteria. And uh, Jim's salary is actually supported by an OIA grant, and we're very fortunate to have Jim here. Hopefully, um, in the coming future, we'll, we'll have uh, a virus which we can release as a biocontrol agent for rhino beetle, and that will be shared with any country that's having this problem, including CNMI. But the, the point is, we've got to get down the population on, on the, uh, the islands where we have these huge outbreaks, such as Guam. Uh, otherwise, even if you do eradicate, the risk of, of reinfestation is very high. Um, so that's, that's my main focus. A couple of other things. We've de developed a roadside survey. You put a, a cell phone on a car, you drive the island, the cell phone records images and records the exact position of the phone. And then I have some special software, some uh, artificial intelligence, which goes through and finds all the coconut trees, uh, puts a damage index on each one and finds all the V-shaped cuts. So on Guam, we're using this to monitor any effects of the control tactics that we're using, but this can also be used for detecting new infestations. And uh, Mark and Dave just finished a survey up on Rota. We sent a cell phone up there with the right software and I, I analyzed the data down here. Um, so we have a map of, of damaged uh, coconuts on, on Rota. 
we thought we found one new site, but I, I'm, I'm not sure on that yet. So this is uh, something that uh, is already kind of operational already. Uh, we're gonna start our third survey of Guam next week. So the idea is you can, you can map out all of the damage and quantify uh, the damage. So on Guam currently, 22% uh, of our coconut trees are showing damage from coconut rhinoceros beetle. That's um, a fifth of all the trees. So here's, here's the damage symptom that was detected by the system automatically on Rota. You can see the V-shaped cut up here, kind of hard to see. So the idea here is um, you have these you know, hours and hours of videos and instead of somebody watching these videos, you just have a computer go through and do all the work for you. So here's the V, pretty sure it was a rhino beetle that, that caused it, but uh, uh, Mark said they, they actually found this particular tree and took it down and, and couldn't find any boreholes. Oh, here's another important thing. If you see a V-shaped cut like this and, and you think it's rhino beetle, you can test that idea out for sure. If a rhino beetle made this V-shaped cut, there will be a borehole in the crown somewhere. It's probably not visible from the ground. And even if you climb up with the ladder, you won't see it because it'll be hidden behind the, the fronds on the outside. So what we recommend in a case like this is if it's not a really precious tree, saw it down and then dissect the, the crown. Pull off the outer fronds one at a time and you will see a borehole at some point if it was rhino beetle. So if rhino beetle made this, this V-shaped cut, uh, that tree will have a borehole in it. I got a couple of ideas that I'd like to follow up. If, if you can automatically find these uh, V-shaped cuts uh, with a you know drone imaging, then you can actually send out another drone to apply pesticide to those very trees. So that might help with the adult situation. But the main thing is finding all of those breeding sites. You gotta find the active breeding sites and the potential breeding sites. So, um, Dallas actually uh, thought about using detector dogs and uh, he set up a program to, to train and uh, deploy detector dogs here on Guam. They're very, very effective. They're trained to sniff out the grubs. So they lead us to, to uh, breeding sites. They're also using this in Hawaii, but dogs are extremely expensive. So I was thinking maybe we can use the beetles themselves to detect other beetles. They do have an aggregation pheromone so they can smell each other out. We tested this idea using a little radio transmitter that we glued onto beetles. And yes, you can find cryptic breeding sites using that idea. But these little radio transmitters are very expensive. They're about $150 a piece. But there has been a technical breakthrough. We now have this technology called harmonic radar. And the tags for harmonic radar are smaller than a grain of salt. Uh, sorry, a grain of rice. And they have unlimited shelf life, unlimited field life. And then you use this little uh, device here to send out radio waves. This sends out radio waves at twice the frequency and, and this device picks it up. Uh, so you can actually track, find these tags out there. The idea is not to follow the beetles, but to glue them on beetles and see where these tags accumulate. Hopefully they'll accumulate at breeding sites. So with these things being less than a dollar a piece, uh, we can do that now. And I am thinking if you could attach this to a drone, you could cover a whole island pretty efficiently and find all the breeding sites and destroy them. And that's one of the keys to eradicating this rhino beetle. So this is just stuff that's um, under development right now. Uh, we did write a grant to do some of this work, but it hasn't been funded yet. So we're, we're kind of stalled on that. Thank you, Dr. Moore, for your presentation this morning again. Uh, thank you also for all the presenters today. Um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ms. Tanya Joshua at our office to do the, uh, the closing. Tanya? Hi, I actually have one question. Can somebody describe for our listening audience, how big is the CRB? What is the size? It's a large insect. Around, around three inches uh, long. Thank you. That will definitely scare. Yeah. That will definitely scare our listening audience. <laughs> On behalf really of scary, actually, uh, uh, some people keep them as pets, and that's a problem. Yes, as Dr. Moore said, I was actually stationed in Japan for a long time, and uh, Japanese do sell that as a pet. They put it in a, in a small aquarium with a jelly, and that's what they eat actually. And the little kids in Japan they use it to, you know, make them fight and, and whatnot.
but yes, back to you. Uh, so on behalf of our leadership and colleagues at the Office of Insular Affairs, we uh, want to thank you for joining us today. I uh, want to just make a special shout out to our federal partners, USDA, thank you uh, for uh, being part of uh, this effort to combat the, the, the CRB in the CNMI. Uh, and also, um, I wanted to say that uh, I wanted to relay, we will be relaying to our leadership at OIA and also to our grant managers and policy team, all of the kind words that you have expressed uh, about the good work that our colleagues at, at OIA do. Uh, in be, on behalf of the CNMI and to counter the coconut rhinoceros beetle. Um, and so before I close again, uh, would uh, let's see, would the Mr. Mayor, would he be available to say a few words? And if, if he's not, uh, we want to just express our appreciation for his joining us today. And maybe we would invite um, Mr. Secretary. Ah, the mayor is there. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Tanya. And uh, I just wanted to uh, express express you know, my appreciation to uh, OIA, um, Mr. Dallas uh, Barrington, uh, Dr. Moore, and all of the uh, individuals involved in helping the island of Rhoda. So that we can control this um, uh, invasive uh, species, not to enter the island of Tinian and Saipan because that would be very devastating to our islands. So like I said, on behalf of the people of Rhoda, the leadership here on the island of Rhoda, uh, we want to express our sincere appreciation for all the help we've been getting from you guys. And if I would, Mr. Secretary, would you like to express a few final words as well on behalf of the CNMI? Government. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Tanya. Thank you, new Mayor, for that uh, special new word. And again, uh, we all want to appreciate what has been done to the CNMI under the OIA. Uh, we have much success to our our playing role here. We'd like to continue to do what we can. I know that majority is sitting in Rhoda, and with more or less the USDA APIS as well. I'm sorry, Mr. D, that you know from the very beginning you were there in the very front row uh, from the very first detection. But again, it was more that uh, they provided us with more of the knowledge and skills that uh, and the continuous training that they they did. And without that, you know, uh, our our folks in Rhoda would be more successful in how how to better approach this new CRV. Uh, be it in the eradication, the control, or just the detection wise. But uh, thank you to all the team. Thank you to our good new, good new representative, Harry Blanco. Thank you, Dr. Moore. And uh, thank you all, new, especially for being together in this new special new uh, podcast that we want to express our situation here in the CNMI. So on behalf of the LNR Saipan, thank you so much to everybody. Thank you for joining us. This has been an episode of OIA Conversations. To learn more about efforts in the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands to combat and to prevent further spread of the destructive and invasive coconut rhinoceros beetle. Thank you very much. Adios. Adios.